In this video, learn how to use multiple time frames to spot huge trades. Hi, I'm Mike Bellafuri, co-founder of SME Capital, and we're a proprietary trading firm located in Midtown Manhattan. And I'm also the author of the trading classic, One Good Trade and The Playbook. In this video, see how an essential technical analysis principle is used to find trades professional traders make with confidence. Let's get to work on teaching you this important trading technique so you can grow your trading account. This is a flag break across multiple time frames that's setting up on the 1, 5, 15 minute. And there's also a dead cat bounce that's taking place on the daily on NKLA. And we'll get a little bit more into detail on what a dead cat bounce really is. And this took place on 7, 8, 2020. And down below, you could kind of see over the last 30 days, this, these are my stats on this particular tag, on this particular setup. Um, I've taken 13 total positions, about a 70% win rate. Um, I lose about 30% of the time. And this is pretty consistent over the last couple of years with this setup. On the ones that are working, I'm holding for about an hour. On the ones that aren't, you know, pretty short, cutting within 20, 25 minutes. And you can see over the last 30 days, you know, this is something that I want to continue to focus on and continue to get a lot bigger on. Okay, so I should mention that we did this playbook together. However, we're going to be overviewing a trade that Kyle took in it. So on the morning of the trade, there was really only one play we were looking at for NKLA, and that was looking for a price to consolidate with range tightening, uh, hopefully trapping shorts in this longer term time frame, setting up a wedge break for us to get long into a potential breakout to the upside. Now, it's important to note that this is meant to be taken as an intraday swing, so we're going to have to be patient with our position sit on our hands at points and really allow price action to work in our favor. In the morning, NKLA had a nice opening drive on unusually high volume, which really set the stage for the price action later on in the day. Now, in general, this strong opening drive is going to be a point of conviction for these flag breakout trades. And it's almost necessary when it's done on these longer time frames because that opening drive sort of sets the height of the flag. And since many shorts are looking to build into what they perceive to be the blow off top on a stop that's overextended and in a longer term downtrend, many shorts are gonna base their positions using that high of day as their stop out point. So this concept often leads to aggressive short squeezes. And in essence, it's, those, it's that short squeeze idea that really makes this trade work. So for a bigger picture idea, at this point, SPY was ranging just over 315 and has been in an intermediate term uptrend since the March sell-off. However, the EV names have been dramatically outperforming the market and somewhat moving in tandem. So throughout the day, we're going to be putting less emphasis on SPY's price action and more emphasis on the price action of NIO and Tesla, some of the stronger names in the sector, because if we're trying to take a breakout trade in NKLA, but Tesla and NAO are starting to roll over and look like they might be seeing their backside, our win rate and expected value for the trade is going to be a decent bit lower. So we just want to be aware of how the overall sector is trading. Now, the EV names, I think everyone's been watching them for the last two or three weeks, and they've been very in play with names like Tesla, Workhorse, NAO, and Nikola having very extreme parabolic run-ups. And given how extreme the moves have been, a lot of people have been looking, have been getting interested in getting short, looking for a rollover of the sector. And of these EV names, NKLA was the only one yet to experience a severe reversal from its run-up. So as the weakest name in the sector, when NKLA puts in this price action of gapping up in the morning and having a strong opening drive, many players are going to be looking to build into short positions on NKLA, using it as a vehicle for an overextended sector. And as a little side point, we've been in a elevated VIX environment for the last couple months. And when we see that, and when we see VIX in the upper 20s, like we saw on this day, we're going to be more keen to look for trend trades since individual stocks, as well as the overall market, are more prone to putting in directional movement. So for intraday fundamentals, Nikola, as I said, is an EV name. They're mostly focused on their hybrid trucks. Um, as far as intraday catalysts, we saw an upgrade from JP Morgan citing Nikola as saying the, the stock is starting to look attractive for long-term investors. However, from my experience, these statements from the banks as well as bank price upgrades, while they can add fuel to the fire, they're rarely the real catalyst for big moves. 
Um, instead, we've seen the theme in the EV names for the last couple of weeks, which has been that they haven't necessarily been fueled so much by changing fundamentals. Rather, we've just seen that it's a hot sector, shorts are continually getting squeezed, longs continue to chase it, and we've just had a general supply and demand imbalance. So we're not really treating this as a changing fundamental strategy. Just on that point, fair to say Tesla has run up a ton, causing a lot of interest in the sector, and people are looking for other EV plays to perhaps be, I don't want to say the next Tesla, but to really gain some interest. Totally. Okay, so these are the statistics on NKOA. The volume at the time was, or on the day was 51 million, almost 52. The daily volume is 12.28 million. The relative volume on this at, on the day was 4.21. So, so fair to say that the one of the catalysts is that the leader in the space is not only up a lot, but up more than lots of people think in the marketplace. Totally. And fair to say that is a potentially one of our catalysts. Yes. Okay. All right, okay, great. So the relative volume on NKLA, NKLA on this day was 4.21. What this tells us is, you know, the stock is certainly in play. Um, it's doing four times its, you know, normal volume over a period of days. The ATR is 9.91, and this gives you a good idea of what you should be looking for in terms of a target. The short float is 8%. Shares float is 107 million. Not too high, not too low. You know, the stock can certainly move with the amount of volume that it's doing, about half of its float on the day. The institutional ownership is 5%, and the insider ownership is very low at 0.7. So the daily on NKLA, it started with this massive volume day, and it's kind of this blow off type of action after a number, number of days that it ran up, um, putting some shorts, you know, getting some shorts involved and stopping out some longs. And then we kind of pull into this 9 EMA and get really tight on the daily. And we begin, begin to make higher lows, slowly squeezing out some shorts. Then we break over this daily flag on a gap up on elevated volume, blowing out shorts, and the stock goes parabolic. That's certainly something you want to see um, on a daily if you're looking to maybe find a long setup. And then later, you know, 20, 10 to 20 days later, we see that sharp sell off for three days once that support has snapped. And then we see the stock. Um, it stops making lower lows on the daily and bases over the previous day high on high volume. And that's kind of that dead cat bounce type of action on very high volume. And what this means is, you know, the stock has sold off for a number of days on relatively high volume. We're starting to see, you know, some shorts take some profits, cover buying back that stock. We're seeing some dip buyers get involved who maybe think this is a good price. Um, so that's a day that we're actually involved in it on the long setup. If you want to learn three real-world setups that our traders use, including the simple setup that we teach all of our new traders and the setup that turned one of our traders into a seven-figure big money earner, check out the free webinar that we're currently running. Just go ahead and click the link that should be appearing right now at the top right-hand corner of your screen. That's going to open up this free registration page in the new window. So don't worry, you're not going to lose this video. You're going to learn more in a couple of hours from this trading workshop than from years of online education. Okay, and if we zoom in a little bit to the 15-day hourly, two things really stand out to us. So one is the volume, which is, if you look left, very uncharacteristic with respect to the last couple of weeks of price action. Um, so this tells us that we might be seeing a change of character in the stock. We hadn't seen volume like this since the two-day run-up up to 94 in NKLA. So definitely a change in character for the name as well as when we open within the first 30 minutes, we get above our pre-market highs. And for the rest of the day, we never get back to those levels. So showing some real strength in the name as we can't put any significant, meaningful push downwards. Okay, so this is a five minute on the given day that we were involved in it or that I was involved in it. And you could kind of see that um, some longs take this early flag. Um, it was a tad extended on the 15 minute and the hourly. I was taking a look at it. It's just a little bit too extended for me. 
Um, the risk to reward didn't really make sense, but you know you saw some volume come in, so you know some longs took it, um, as well as some shorts getting stopped out there, you know over that lower high, and we now know you know some low overhead longs are involved here, and where they're probably risking off that previous five minute low, and then we see you know it break down, puts in a lower high, and shorts hit in on the breakdown with risk off the lower high, and we don't really break down any further than VWAP. And that's actually right where the 15 minute um, time frame is at, the 9 EMA. And it's holding that level really well. And then we get bought back up. And that quickly puts, you know, shorts underwater at break even and with a decision to make. So then there's a few spots that I note that we'll get into later where I end up getting long um, with risk off 49.69. And I'll show that level in a little bit. We pull into the 15 minute 9 EMA and hold at around 49.80. Stop is at 49.69. It holds this 15 minute and builds higher lows. And something that's really important to note, I can tell you when I first got involved in the market, I certainly was not looking at, you know, multiple time frames. I was looking at, you know, the one minute and the five minute and really that was it. So we know that, you know, a lot of other people also do that. You know, newer people to the market aren't really looking at, you know, a handful of time frames or looking at the one minute, maybe the five minute. And that's really it. But, you know, if you zoom out to the 15 minute, it's actually holding up really well. And if you use, you know, the 9 EMA as a reference point, you can see that, you know, it's in fact still really bullish and it's not breaking down. Right. So as Kyle was just saying, using the 15 minute is useful. Kyle does a very good job of this in general of not just using the one minute and the five minute, but also zooming out to the 15 minute and the hourly and making sure that the trend is still intact and it's aligned across all of these time frames. Because a lot of people, if they just look at the one minute and five minute, especially later in the day here at 2 p.m. ish, um, it's going to be really easy to chop yourself around uh, without much meaningful price action. So zooming out like this is useful. And another thing that's important to note is everyone is going to draw their wedges or flags a little bit differently with their trend lines. So I don't like to get too exacting with how I treat uh, price movement above or below those trend lines. But it is important to note that some people saw that action there when it breaks out and then moves back down, might have gotten some long stopped out and might have gotten some shorts into the play. So we want to be staying looking at the 15 minute to make sure that that's not having a detrimental impact on the trend idea we're having. And a very easy way to do this now is if you see that the candle that the second arrow is pointing to, well, the next bar after that, an easy way of gauging whether the trend is broken for the short term at least, is if we get a red candle close above that 9 EMA, we would both immediately be out of our positions. If it's gonna break out, we'll have time to get in later, but for the short term, it looks like it would be breaking down. Um, and then while that 15 minute candle is being formed, that's when you wanna be hopping down to your one minute and five minute charts and making sure that that short term price action isn't showing you something uh, detrimental to the trade, something that's showing you that, no, that really was a false breakout and we're likely to roll over. And that would allow us to perhaps get out of our trade before we hit our hard stop, our hard stop placement and avoid taking a full unit of risk unnecessarily. Hey guys, so can we go back to the daily chart? Sure. I like what you're doing here saying, hey, we're not just going to use the one minute and the five minute on an intraday chart we want to use more information. We want to use multiple time frames. So let's look at a 15 minute, let's look at an hourly, even on the intraday. And if we do that, we're going to get information as to how more players are looking at this particular trade. Us broadening the time frame that we're looking at, not just the one and the five, but adding others is us seeing how the other players are voting as to this trade, as to the strength of the stock on the intraday. So we're, we're getting more people involved by doing that. One thing that I'd like you guys to clean up when looking at your daily chart is I heard you say it broke a short term momentum indicator. Good to use that. I heard you say we got involved again because it started to go back up and the volume 
was elevated. All of that is terrific. All of that I encourage you to do. I'd clean up your analysis here by adding one thing in particular, which is the way that you're demarcating that this, that this is still on the daily chart in a long-term uptrend and showing that and, and being specific about that. And, and that I actually didn't hear you say, I know you're thinking it, but how are you going to demarc that? How are you going to express that idea to yourselves so you're clear about that? Does that make sense? Absolutely. And a good way to gauge that would just be showing that we're still, regardless of this short-term action in the last couple of days, we're still holding above the level from which we broke out at the beginning of June. We're still holding above that 37-ish area, holding above 40. Yeah, and that's fine. That's a simple way to do it. In the playbook, I'd like for you to say that. In your analysis, I'd like for you to look for it, expect it, and say that. Gotcha. Because it's not just that it started to go back up after going down. It started to go back up after going down, still above an important breakout price, right? If it had been below an important breakout price, this would be a different trade, correct? Yes. So we gotta be clear about, all right, so we gotta be clear about that. All right, good, back to where you were. Um, so a couple things we're looking for, a little checklist for this trade, as we've kind of alluded to, our ball being over three and VIX being over 20 is really nice, as well as the alignment of the trend among the one, five, 15 and 60 minute chart. One thing I'd like to say that I enjoy quite a bit about this trade and these swing ideas is that they work for a broad a broad variety of markets. So they work on a bunch of different prices, stocks of different floats, as well as just completely different instruments. Um, the price action uh, tends to follow through in all these different markets, which is, which is good to look for. As well as price not dramatically extended from the 9 EMA on these timeframes, we're looking to see a breakout. So if we're too extended from the 9 EMA, it might be difficult for us to see much more upside. As well as a reason for shorts to be entering into positions, whether that's due to changing fundamentals or just technical analysis or overextension. In this case, we're seeing an overextended stock in an overextended sector. As well as successive higher lows forming the structure of that flag. Lower volume relative to the uptrends when we see the pullbacks, which we saw throughout the day showing that sellers are less eager about this trade than buyers are and we're more likely to see higher upside, as well as volume and price acceleration on the flag breakout. This is a breakout trade, so we want that to be seen both in price and volume. Hey guys, if I could just jump in, I'd love for you guys to be thinking about as a, as a group, as a team, what percentage of volume was done on the offer in the up move and working to see if you can use that as another variable in your favor. So what percentage was done on the offer? What percentage was done on the bid? What was done? What, was, what percent was done on the midpoint? Let's get that reading. And there are guys at the firm who have done this and you can reach out to them and start to work on that and see if that, that variable will help you in this trade. So for instance, if we're getting a lot of buying on the offer, compared to the way the stock normally trades. Can you use that as a variable in this trade uh, to make a better trade decision? Yeah, I actually was just reaching out to Houston about that exact thing a couple of days ago. I definitely want to be looking into that on Cloud Quan, testing out a couple of different ideas. Okay, so this is how I handled getting involved. And first I take that break of 50-50 as a previous lower high is a level shorts likely have their stops. Wanting to be in on the break Break out of the flag at 50.51 as likely some shorts will hop out early on this technical breakout as well as longs across multiple time frames hopping in. So it's kind of that flag break. It's also getting close to that lower high. And something you have to note on this stock is it can get really thin um, or it can get really spready at, you know, when prices lift on the offer, key prices like 50.50, that half dollar, whole dollar, um, lower highs. So. I was thinking that a lot of shorts, you know, are worried about getting slipped through that lower high. So I was thinking maybe some of them are gonna be covering through this flag. That's why I kind of took that 50-50 break as opposed to waiting for that lower high to break. And this is 
and I'm risking all of my earlier PL on the day plus 20% of my daily stop. This is an A plus setup for me, so I want to get relatively big. I'm willing to use my PL from earlier in the day to do that. It's not something I used to do in the past, and it certainly hindered my success. Um, you know, if you're up earlier in the day and you get an A plus setup, well, you want to make sure you're getting big enough in it. So then the second ad, I bring down my cost basis a bit. And this is an ad that I'm going to talk about a little bit later that I don't really like. Um, on the one minute, there's a quick spike and it looks like it's going to reclaim and then break out. But it didn't really do that. And it bounced off the 15 minute 90 MA. And again, it was a bit of a fake out for me on the one minute. So I added a little bit more risk than I would have liked. And I'm now risking all of my earlier PL plus 40% of my daily stop. And this is a position that I'm probably going to take a full unit of risk if I'm wrong. And I'm okay with that. Um, more times than not, you know, if you're going in risking X, there's usually a spot that you can get out where you don't have to lose that full unit of risk. I did come to terms that this is probably going to be one of the times where I do, and that's okay. Um, so we hold the 15 minute and get another at, and I get another ad bringing down my cost basis to 5040 with risk off 4968. Um, still, although if the next 15 minute bar opens and breaks below 49.80, that low that we talked about, um, that low that you can see there, if that 15 minute bar opens below, I'm going to hit out. I'm going to bid out of it. So I'm going to save myself a little bit on it, you know, maybe 10, 20 cents. I'm not going to end up taking that full unit of risk because if it doesn't, in fact, end up breaking below that, um, the idea is dead, at least for the short term. So risk is now all of earlier PL plus 52% of daily stop. Um, that is from the hard stop. And then I have one more ad, but the new risk is off 49.80. Um, we'll get into that. We're going to show the tape a little bit to clear this up. And risk is all off earlier PL plus 40% of daily stop. Higher low as new stop allowed you to risk less now. So this, this higher low um, on this final ad finally gave me conviction that, okay, I could put my hard stop there. If I am wrong, um, you know, I need to move out of the way and that's okay. The first exit I have, this is a big mistake that I have. I throw an order out in the market to sell one fourth right over 51. And this is not okay because 51 is the breakout zone. This is where I'm most convinced that this is working. So this is a spot that it should really open up as shorts stop out and longs are hopping in. I want to cover some risk on the first turn, usually a fourth or a third to pay myself and to cover some risk. But that first turn really isn't until 53. So I'm doing, doing myself a big disservice by covering a fourth right over 51, right when I'm most convinced that this is going to work. And that's really only at one R. So it's not even really doing a lot in terms of taking risk off the table. Because again, it's only one fourth. And then I split up the second quarter in two even lots. Again, there's no sign of a turn here, so I should not be selling at any, especially with the idea that this can go to 56, maybe even 60 bucks. And there's no turn, so there's no reason for me to be selling anything here. And then I covered the third quarter in three even lots. This 53 stuff is where you should be selling your first quarter. So you can see it kind of breaks over 53 and then pulls back in. That should really be my first exit on my first quarter, as opposed to the exits prior. That's the first turn. It broke over that whole dollar, offer stepped up, and it pulled back in. It couldn't hold that 53 level. So when that 53 level gives out, that's where I should be you know, throwing out one fourth and still looking to ride most of my position. And then I get flat into 54 big offers, and there was a good likelihood that it was gonna retest the 15 minute. We were getting super late in the day, and there's just more of a possibility of it pulling back in two to three bucks to that 15 minute time frame, as opposed to making it all the way to 56. It did in fact make it to 56. You know, the risk to reward got a little bit wonky where all of a sudden I'm kind of risking two to three bucks to maybe make another 50 cents to a dollar into the end of the day. So that's kind of why I ended up getting flat. Hey guys, I just want to use the same language, make sure we're on the same page with the same language. When we're short and uh, we take some of our position off the table, that's us covering. So we're short 3,000 shares and we take one third off the position. That means we're covering one third. If we're long 3,000 shares 
and we sell uh, a third, you know, that means we're, we're offering it out, we're selling it, uh, we're taking some profits. Uh, we don't use the word cover unless we're short and we're buying back uh, some of our uh, short position. Yeah, sorry. Pretty Bad common. common. Yeah. Pretty common. Okay, so I'm already long at 5046 from that initial spot. Um, and then you can kind of see that it gets back over $50. It's starting to get tight. This is again where the 15 minute time frame is. It's holding up um, and we're building higher lows. And I'm looking to add through this flag. It's kind of hard to see because um, it's super zoomed in, zoomed in on the one minute. But I'm thinking if we start to see volume here, um, this is a spot where shorts are thinking they're, you know, this might not actually break down for them. And, you know, some longs are probably going to hop in. So we're just kind of looking at the offers. At this point, I realize, okay, I should be adding here. I'm going to bring down my cost basis a little bit, another 10 cents. And now I'm going to be able to risk off this new higher low of 49.80. Mm. And in general, offers. the bids have been sticking to this $50 level and not letting it get too far below that. So this is a pretty do or die spot for us. Yeah. And you could kind of see 50, 20 breaks. I add to my position. This is where it should really start to work. You do start to see some volume come in and we're building higher lows. And you could kind of see almost like panic on the tape. You could start to see, you can start to see offers lift. That means, you know, some shorts are covering, some longs are thinking I need to get involved now before I end up buying this way too high. Um, so you could almost see that panic on the tape. And then we kind of just start building higher lows from it. And then we want to go to one more spot. And again, now I'm risking off 49.80 as opposed to that stop prior at 49.69. Okay, we get back over that lower high and we're kind of flagging here and 51 is nearby. There's probably a lot of people risking off 51. And this is where I really made one of the bigger mistakes is you can see I have an order to sell one fourth out right over 51. And you can see volume come in you can see, you know, it pushes away from price. And on that 51 break, it actually skipped 20 cents. So if you're short, you're getting slipped 20 cents. If you had your stop right at 5101, if you wanted to get long at 5101, you're filling at 5120. And again, this is where I'm most convinced that this is going to work. So there's no reason why I should really be selling one fourth. I have a target of 56, maybe to $60 in mind. There's no reason for me to be taking off one fourth at around one R. It does nothing in terms of taking risk off the table. I'm still risking off 49.83. Sure, I'm risking a little bit less, but it doesn't make sense to be risking less um, when I'm most convinced that this is working. If anything, this is a spot to add maybe a momentum lot through 51 or when offers decrement at 51. Yeah, and so we see while this is happening, volume is spiking more than it has in hours. So again, this is conviction that this is working. And also we need to recognize that this is a $50 stock and in essence, this is a short squeeze idea. So we're not looking to capture a 10 cent short squeeze. We're looking to capture a short squeeze of a point or multiple points. Totally. And we could kind of see that it starts to work a little bit. It's going to get back over 51. There are some decent offers, but we lift right back over 51 and then we're kind of just, you know, we're in the money. So even if I, you know, this is a spot where, okay, I made that mistake of taking some off. If anything, I should be adding it back here. Um, you know, we're going to make mistakes, but there's no reason why I can't add it back right here as I'm, you know, most convinced that this is in fact going to work. So again, you could kind of just see that panic on the tape where offers are lifting, shorts are thinking, man, I really should have stopped out on that 51 break um, or earlier. And you could just see that, you know, they're throwing bids out, it's holding and it's really working out nicely. Yeah, and so we see the volume came in, we broke about 51 and stuff below, but pretty much immediately reclaimed with high volume. And we still have that 5205 morning high above us to squeeze even more shorts out. This is, you know, this is going well for us. Totally. Um, and then you can see I throw another order out there. And again, there's really no sign of a turn at all. So even this order doesn't make a whole lot of sense. 
I'm throwing out some orders out there and we'll go over a quick fix for this that I've been working on. Um, and we could kind of just zoom forward a little bit and we could see how well this position is working. And you could kind of see how small I'm getting. Um, and that is a mistake. I really like, as we focus on the new playbook, I really like how you guys embedded the tape into this playbook and have those concise segments where the tape was important that you can show us and you guys can go back to and watch so that this trade makes a little bit more sense to you, that you're building or reading the tape skills and that overall this playbook trade uh, is more impactful for you guys. Highly encourage you guys to keep doing that. It's been a really nice addition that I've liked. All right, good. So let's hear about how you are gonna fix these exits. Okay, so actually it starts with one of the ads. So that um, there's two areas that I can improve on. And the first was with the second ad that was a tad early. As I kind of ran after that one minute spike, it added some more risk that wasn't needed at the time. I can always take it off and add it back it wasn't a lot, it was a couple hundred shares of that. So, you know, I can always take it off, add it right back. Yeah, look, and for those of you who've read Market Wizards and remember Paul Tudor Jones's chapter in Market Wizards, who, you know, is one of the great all-time traders in US markets and global markets. But one of the things he does and recommends when he's in a position that doesn't feel right to him and one of the recommendations he gives to traders is, look, if it doesn't feel right, you can always get out. Get out, get flat. And then, if things set up again, you can always get back in. So, but remembering his great advice completely supports what you were just saying, but that is a part of active trading, which is, I'm in this trade, I added to this trade, that doesn't feel right. Let me take some off. Okay, now it feels right again, so let me get back in. Huge advantage we have, right? We're not hedge fund traders who have to hold for multiple months. Uh, we're not big institutional traders who have to move millions of shares every trade. We're, we're flexible and we're light and we can get in and we're nimble. Nimble is the best word. We're nimble. So, you know, even when guys get bigger, they can nimbly get in and out of, you know, in a case like this, you can nimbly get in and out of 10,000 shares for something like this. Don't do that yet, please. <laughs> when you when you get a little bit more experience. Yeah, um, totally. And then more, and then obviously more as you get bigger, but nimble, the, the, the ability to be nimble is such an advantage and we want to use it. That's a structural advantage that we have other, over other market players. It's a structural advantage. Though that is what creates the really great trading strategies. It's just a structural advantage. And so one of them is we can be nimble while others can't. And so if getting out and getting back in is a characteristic of a structural advantage. We wanna make sure that in our game, in our trading system, that we thought about how to maximize that for ourselves. So very good point. So the main issue with this is really with the exits as you guys probably saw. I worked really hard to get big and to get into this A plus idea with a five to six point target in mind. And I started taking cells to really come to terms with taking some risk you know, at taking some risk off the table, but I'm taking risk off the table when I'm most, con you know, when the idea is most confirmed through that 51, a lot of shorts are risking off that level. A lot of longs are hopping in. We saw volume move in. We saw it, you know, push away from price. You know, as soon as it broke 51, it skipped to 51.20. Um, so it doesn't make any sense to be covering, so taking some risk, selling some risk when you're doing so at the point of being most convinced that the idea is valid. Um, if anything, you should be getting bigger, you know, adding a momentum lot at this 51 break with a new risk for it. Plus, 
you know, selling at a quarter of risk at around 1R doesn't do a whole lot in terms of taking risk off the table, as your stop is still the same level at this time. So taking one fourth off at 1R, around 1R, um, and you still have the same level that you're risking off of, it, it might help you out a little bit mentally, but it's not doing a whole lot in terms of your P&L. You want to be the biggest when you're most convinced. Um, so the first turn um, that you should have sold your first quarter was not until 53 broke and pulled back under and offers got heavy. We saw some big offers over 53. They couldn't lift. Um, and a quick fix on this is not having that first exit out in the market and instead having you know quick shares ready to go, um, whether it's a fourth or a third. I'm ready to go so you can hit the offer or the bid on the first turn. This is gonna allow me to make more. So instead of having that first order out in the market ready to fill right over 51, let me see how it reacts over 51. If it keeps going and there's no sign of a turn until 53, well, I could have made another two bucks on that first quarter. And that's really gonna help my bottom line. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I really like how you're waiting to see something very different. You're in this stock, you're watching this stock, it's working. Now something is different around 53. It's getting heavier, as you say. The tape is clearly different. And because it's clearly different, and we can identify what clearly different means to us, it's heavy on the tape. That means there's more sellers that are coming in. That means it's harder to trade higher, to find higher prices than previously. And we've watched how the stock is trading higher and trading higher and trading higher. And then we're noticing, hey, it's harder at 53 for it to trade higher relative to how it did from 51 to 53. That's different. That's different. That is something that we can point to. That is something that we can describe. That's something that we can build into a system. That does mean that the stock is different. That does mean that the risk reward is not as good based on our trading skills. That does mean that we have a trade decision to take off some risk as opposed to your other positions, which were a, bit, were a little bit more random. That is a very, very legitimate way for you to be thinking about a trade decision to take off some risk. Yeah, and this is something that Graham and I spoke quite a bit about, and he made a really po good point, and you need to be okay with handing back some unrealized gain at times to really capture the meat of the move. Again, taking 50 cents, covering a quarter doesn't make a whole lot of you know, sense. Looking for six, six points, there's no sign of a turn. Um, you know, it's okay to hand back some unrealized gain at times. Um, if it means, you know, more times than not, you're gonna capture a bigger, you know, portion of the move. And to put that in a little bit of context, this made it to nine, nine R in the regular hours. A lot further in after hours, it made it to like 60 bucks or so, a little bit over that. Um, and that 9R really was your target of around $56, and you took only 3R on the name. This is just, you know, this is just bad. And look, you want to measure this, right? So you're yeah. trying to develop an exit system for this particular type of trade. And so we're going to measure how you're taking your profits. And so, look, if it just so happens that taking profits along the way into target is going to make this system better, that's fine. Now, what we're just going to do is we're just going to raise the size overall at the beginning of the trade. We can do that too. Yeah, that makes sense. So one thing to note is I was bigger in this name and I did make more than usual, but that doesn't you know, make it okay that I didn't capture the meat of the move. I need to continue to work on this and be more patient, especially with the early sells. It's okay to hand back some unrealized gains on your best ideas once in a while, if it means you're gonna make a lot more over time. And that's what it's really all about. If you wanna be explosive like this, you know, um, a few people at the firm have talked about this in some of the happy hours. I've heard Raf talk about it where, you know, he said, you know, it's not fun to hand back, you know, a car worth of profit, but, it, you know, that's something that at times you have to do, especially when you get a lot bigger. Um, so if some of the best are talking about that and they're okay with doing it, it's something that I should certainly be okay with doing at times as well. In Raf's case, a very nice car. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> 
Uh, and so just one last thing we wanted to touch on is how you could use tech to help you with your trading. So I've been doing a lot more coding now than I was doing last summer. And I wouldn't say I'm at the level where I feel that I could make some robust automated strategy, but you can still use it to help alert you when some of your favorite setups are showing up in the market. So we see in the top just some basic filters for volume, percent change, RVOL, price, and position with relation to VWAP. But something that's nice about being with SMB is that the tech allows us to add in some more nuanced and complex, uh, some more complex logic to our code. So on the bottom, essentially what we're seeing is a filter. It's checking for all the stocks that met the criteria above. We're looking over the last 60 minutes and seeing if it's consolidating in the top half of the range, holding above VWAP, as well as the lows of that consolidation range aren't you know, peaking lower into the bottom half of the range. And most importantly is that the highs of that consolidation range aren't themselves daily highs. We wanna make sure that, as we've said several times, this is in essence a short squeeze idea. So we want the daily high to still be there so that when the breakout happens, that stop out level will add fuel to the short squeeze. So this is a nice thing to have. It's specific enough such that we're not just getting 50 names throughout the day and hardly any of them are actually what we're looking for. But it's also general enough so that we are getting two to five names throughout the day that are popping up on our alert scanner and giving us time to look at them and deciding if we want to trade them with some discretion. Good, Graham. And I like as we're building this new playbook that we're adding code for a filter in this case, an alert in this case, for this particular trade. There's three different ways that we use technology at the firm. The first step in your evolution as a technology trader is one, let me build a filter that will alert me to my favorite setups. Terrific, important. What if you're armed with alerts for all of your best trades, as opposed to not being, how much better are you gonna do? So that technology is going to help you make more money and you can build custom filters. You can work together to build custom filters, which are going to alert you to your favorite trades. Really love how you've added this to the new playbook. And the second way is scripts. So you guys may decide that there are certain setups that you really love. You know, they're not just very good trades. They're terrific trades. And you may notice from your stats that you trade them really well. You may want to decide, hey, let me supplement my discretionary trading with building a script. And a script, what a script does is that every time you find specific parameters in the marketplace, it's going to get you into a position. And then with discretion, you'll trade out of it. And so there are traders at the firm for their favorite strategies who will have, will make money with discretion, who will make money with scripts, and then will also make money with automated models. You're not going to ever get to the point of being able to build scripts if you don't first learn how to build filters. So you guys are, are going through that. And then you're not going to be able to build models unless you learn how to build scripts. So you may find an A plus, A plus, A plus setup where you playbook and you say, you know what, it's so good, I want to automate that strategy. So I'm going to build rules into that strategy and I'm going to build rules out to that strategy. And that's going to be in a separate account and your technology is going to take care of that and you'll make money off of that. In the same type of setup, you may trade with discretion as well. So for a A plus setup, an A plus A plus setup, you may push the buttons and make a discretionary trade. You may have scripts that are getting you into the position as well automatically, and you may have an automated model. And think about for your best setups, how much more you're going to make in your best setups, then you just pushing the buttons and you just pushing the buttons without 
alerts. All three of those layers help you make them help you make a lot more. But this is that first step in you guys building that in that skill, building the filters to alert you to your best setups, and from there you'll be able to do a lot more with technology. So love how you added this to the new playbook. Hey, go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos they're producing for you in the trading community. And please take the time to add your feedback in the comment section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video from all of us at SMB. Train and trade well.